Good evening. I uh, just want to welcome everybody to the third Hawk Talk of the season. We're looking at a history of Halloween tonight. A uh, couple announcements to get out of the way before we start. Uh, students, uh, if you're here for credit, make sure you sign in over there next to the food down on the end of the counter. And uh, we'll make sure to email your instructors and let them know that you're here. Um, also, in two weeks, November 10th, we're going to have another talk. It's Framing the Past, Collections and Exhibits at the Small Museum. And that's with the Elkhorn Valley Museum Registrar, Drew DeCamp. So, I'd like to welcome Paul Muncy. He is a native of Modesto, California. He began his teaching career at the age of 17 by doing some drum lessons. And he spent his 20s teaching drum lines and marching bands. But uh, then Paul went on and earned his BA, California State University Stanislaus, in 2007, uh, history MA uh, from CSU as well in 2009. In 2010, Paul began his career as an adjunct history instructor at various institutions. He's taught at Modesto Junior College, at CSU Stanislaus in Turlock, uh, San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton, and Cabrillo College in Aptos, California. And in 2017, Paul was hired here as a full-time faculty member at Northeast. He's involved in the theater program, and he founded the Hawk Talk series along with being an instructor here on campus. So join me in welcoming Paul Muncy. Everybody, this is a partially costume, partially I'm, I'm trying to bring the cloak back. I feel like it's, uh, it's an accoutrement that we have, have lost and we should have again. So um, this lecture, it's supposed to be uh, about an hour long. And actually, give me a second here. Can you all hear me if I'm just right here or is this not loud enough? No people in the back? Yeah? Okay, I'll try to stick it to the mic then. Or I should say stick with the mic. So. Um, this is supposed to be about an hour long lecture, about 30 minutes worth of Q&A at the end. I'm gonna do my best to keep it to an hour, but we're gonna do all of Halloween. We're gonna start at the very beginning. I'm gonna take it all the way up to today. So uh, bear with me if we go a little bit over that hour of time. Now, like, like many, for me, the holiday season starts in October. Starts uh, with the, the Halloween feel um, one of my favorite memories growing up was that's like when you got to start doing crafts in class, right? And then you got to make the, the little hand turkeys in November, and then you got to make the snowflakes in December. I had a, a lot of uh, fond memories of that. Still for me, this is about the time the, the year starts to feel kind of magical. Humans, though, uh, have for a long time marked the equinoxes and the solstices as holy days. Holy just means separate or apart from other things. Equinox, or the solstices are of course uh, the summer being the longest day of the year, the winter being the shortest day of the year, and the equinoxes being somewhere in the middle. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is mostly what's happening between the autumnal equinox, which happens in September, and the winter solstice, which happens in December. Uh, just a quick preview, I will be giving a history of Christmas in December, and we'll get some of that winter solstice stuff as well. Um, but What's interesting about this, or what we need to note about as we go, is that most human societies didn't actually celebrate something on the autumnal equinox, because that's when the harvest season started. You couldn't celebrate while you had all that food to harvest, and so most of the celebrations that humans had during the fall season, those harvest uh, celebrations, happened somewhere, usually pretty directly between the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice. Um, well, this was all a global phenomenon. This is something that all human beings have done everywhere. We're really going to be focusing primarily on the European traditions and how they made their way to the United States. But just to make sure we're really clear, uh, China has their Mooncake Festival that usually takes place during the autumn. We just got done uh, with Diwali, uh, uh, the Indian Festival of Lights. European traditions, for whatever reason, have had a tendency over the last two or three thousand years to focus on death during the, uh, this time between the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice. We, a good example of this is the Eleusinian mysteries of the Greeks. We don't know exactly when they happened. They definitely happened sometime in September, 
probably actually on the autumnal equinox, and of course, we're talking about the Greeks here uh, as a slave society, of course they had time to do this on the autumnal equinox, because the slaves were doing all of the actual harvesting at the time. Uh, the Eleusinian, the Eleusinian Mysteries, they're a fascinating celebration that the Athenians had. It was actually in two parts. In the spring, they had their lesser mysteries that were kind of the preparation for the big mysteries that took place in the fall. And to be clear, when I'm talking about mysteries, what I'm talking about is some type of secret knowledge that gets passed on only to initiates who go through all of this. Uh, if you're familiar at all with the myth of Persephone uh, and Demeter and Hades, uh, per Persephone gets kidnapped by Hades sometime in the autumn, and her mother Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, gets uh, very sad, and she doesn't let anything grow. This is why in the winter nothing grows. But the Greeks uh, went through this very elaborate ritual that, that probably lasted about nine days. And again, you had to start your training for this back in the spring. And then it, if once you were ready, you would go through this nine-day festival that we don't know a lot about, but the reports we have is that it sounds terrifying. That the Greeks may have been taking some type of drug, uh, possibly ergot, which is kind of like LSD, so they're tripping pretty hard. And then people would come out dressed as Hades or dressed as other types of demons escorting them down into the underworld. And the idea was to experience death, to experience this and get some type of truth that you could find only from that experience, that people only who had went through that would have that knowledge. So it's the little, again, a hint of where things are gonna be going. Though really, and it is a little warm in here, so I'm gonna take off this stylish cloak. But really, uh, the Celts are probably the primary origin of a lot of the Halloween traditions that we're familiar with. The Celts were once the most widespread culture throughout Europe. In the modern day, there are still descendants of the Celts, uh, the Scottish, the Irish, the Welsh, the Britannies, the Manx. Uh, there's little pockets here and there throughout the rest of Europe, but most of them are just in the British Isles. And the Celts had a festival called Samhain. If you ever see it, it looks like it's Samhain. It's pronounced Samhain. And Samhain took place between the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice. It was a three-day party. Uh, and this three days, keep in the back of your mind, because while we think of Halloween and maybe even All Hallows Day as a two-day festival, this is really uh, gonna stick with the Europeans for a long time. This three-day festival was one in which they remembered their dead. It was one in which, after they were done with the harvest, they made use of that, that first bounty of food to celebrate those that had come before them. And Samhain was seen as the best night for divination. Divination, being able to, to uh, prophesize the future, to be able to talk with others. And it was believed that at this moment, the Samhain moment, the veil between this world and the quote other world. This is not the underworld. This is the the weird the world of spirit. This is the world of uh, of special power or that that unique power of nature. It was it was believed this time that the veil was lifted between our world and the other world, and so it was a time that the spirits of the ancestors were able to make their way back. And it was thought, because they were part of now this other world, they had special insight. It was a time when you could ask your ancestors, what is going to happen in the future? When it, can you, you know, like, should I get married next year? Should, uh, should our tribe go to war next year? What should I plant in the spring? It was a chance to tap into this knowledge. Uh, what the uh, many Celts would do during this time is they would set out bonfires. Uh, part of this was to rejuvenate the sun. The sun is dying during this time, it's getting, the days are getting shorter and shorter, and the idea was if we burn a little bit more, it's going to give a little bit of extra boom, just so the sun sticks around a little bit longer. And while they're out at these bonfire parties, they would leave their doors open. They would leave out food and drink for their dead relatives. So 
So again, this is this is the one chance every year, if anybody's familiar with like the Day of the Dead down in Mexico, same type of thing. It's the one chance every year that you can really commune, not just with those that you knew, but your ancestors going back generations. The problem was the opening of the underworld also opened it up for demons and fairies to roam the earth. And so what some Celtic folk would do during this time is they would blacken their faces with soot uh, with the idea of making themselves look like demons so the demons would think they're one of them. Does anybody here a fan of The Walking Dead? You know, if you're familiar with The Walking Dead where they put all the the dead's guts on them so that they can't be uh, found out. That's essentially what this original idea of doing something that's eventually going to become masks. It was to protect yourself from this lifting of the veil and to protect yourself from the demons and the fairies who might come through. Those that did this, though, I, I think sometimes when we look at ancient folks, we think of these rituals as being so serious. And certainly they were. I mean, this is tapping into important beliefs of them. But everybody's always had a sense of humor. And what a lot of these folks who would blacken their face or when they would put on different types of clothing, they would travel from house to house and then they would perform a silly routine in exchange for food and drink. So you show up to somebody's house, you're like, oh, I'm a demon, I'm a demon. Hey, how about a beer? <laughs> this was, uh, you can get just that little hint of trick or treating. We're not quite there yet, but we definitely have like a little seed that's planted in the back. Again, I want to emphasize this of Celtic minds. This is very specific to Celts who are mostly going to get wiped out by the Romans. Remember this the back of your mind Scottish, Irish, Welsh. They are going to hold on to some of these traditions. But it's not all just coming from the Celts. Christianity was born at the exact same time that the Roman Republic made the transition from being a republic to being an empire. If you're familiar at all with Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, he starts his reign about the same time that Jesus is born. And over the first three centuries of Christianity getting going, Christians were sometimes persecuted. It was not a common thing. We actually have a, a fantastic letter from Pliny the Younger writing to a later uh, a later emperor where he, he says to him, he's like, yeah, I caught some of these Christians and you know, I've been hearing this weird stuff about them. I hear that they're cannibals. Is anybody familiar with communion? Where you eat <laughs> of the body and the blood. Of, and these are rumors. And, and, I, and I hear like there's, there's some weird incest stuff because they all call each other brother and sister. And so uh, Pliny writes and he's like, okay, I caught him. The food was normal food. And they all seem pretty nice, and they're you know this this whole bit of like what am I supposed to do? I thought like these were like really evil people. And the emperor Trajan writes back and goes, well you know, you got to punish them if they won't worship the emperor and do all the right stuff. But you don't need to go out hunting for these people. This is not what we're about. We're not you know to to use a more modern term, we're not going to do witch hunts against the Christians. Now there were some emperors to be clear. There were some periods where there were some pretty intense persecutions, but it wasn't the norm for those first 300 years. By the time, or actually went back up a little bit there, with the ones who were persecuted, one of the things that really gave Christianity some early boom was that it was very common, not for all, but for many Christians, to go to their death willingly in front of others, right? So you might have heard of like Christians being sent into the stadium and being eaten alive by animals and whatnot. And some of them quite famously just knelt down and let it happen. This blew the mind of a lot of Romans. Uh, if you're familiar at all with the Stoic philosophy, it's pretty much the only philosophy that the Romans thought was cool. They hated Greek stuff, but they liked the Stoic thing. And these Christians just seemed so Stoic to them. Of course, for other Christians that went through this, we have to remember that they had family, and they had friends that watched this happen. And so a common thing when a Christian willingly went to their death, their friends, their family, and the community around them would regularly celebrate their death every year after that. Many of us who have lost loved ones have a similar ritual that we may go through every year to remember the passing of that friend. These folks eventually start being called sanctus. Sanctus just means holy or a holy one. Of course, in English, this eventually gets translated into saint. So these are our first saints. 
These are our first holy people that are considered to be separate or above from everybody. But I want to remind us that this is not some type of just like uh, uh, people that never met them holding up some type of ideal. These were folks celebrating the deaths of loved ones. Well, in the year 313, Christianity was legalized in Rome by Constantine the Great. Uh, he was actually baptized on his deathbed, making him the very first Christian emperor. And after Constantine, all emperors of Rome, with the exception of one, who we don't have time to talk about today, but he is a Julian the Apostate, is a fascinating man. Take my class in Western civilization, I'll tell you all about it. But in the 4th century, in the 300s, Christianity, because the imperial family transitioned, because the imperial family had converted to Christianity, it became very hip for other people. The people were at this point were not being forced into Christianity, but there were a whole lot of people. Like, if you want to move up in the imperial administration, you better be doing the same thing as the emperor. Of course, the emperor's inner circle was also converting at that time. So during the 4th century, during the 300s, this is when we first see Christianity really take off. When Constantine was first baptized, probably 10% of the Roman Empire was Christian. Not the world, 10% of the Roman Empire was Christian. By the time we get to the end of the 300s, somewhere between 75 and 80% of the population had converted to Christianity. This is a huge, huge leap. And then, in the year 390, or somewhere around the year 390, uh, the last emperor of a unified Rome, Theodosius the Great, outlawed all other forms of worship. Uh, this doesn't mean that their other traditions disappeared. I'll come back to this in a second. But it does mean that if you were caught worshiping Jupiter or worshiping Mars or anything else like that, you could find yourself being executed. The script had been completely flipped. Because once again, most Christians weren't going out hunting these people down. But the, uh, the imperial government certainly started leaning heavily on these folks. Now, in the ancient days, during this time uh, of uh, Roman history, and certainly before Theodosius makes it the, the official religion of the entire empire, as is today, people in the country had a tendency to be more conservative, held on to their beliefs a little bit more strongly, and it is, it's kind of odd when we think about the modern day. Of course, cities are where we find more atheists, where we find more secular people. And usually it's in the countryside or in the rural areas that we see more strong uh, religious beliefs. Of course, in our society, it's Christianity. In the Middle East, that's Islam. In India, that's Hinduism and Islam. But the word for villager at the time, uh, or rustic, a rustic person, was pagan. Pagan uh, was used by Christians in the cities to really mean kind of, it was meant to be pejorative, it was like hick uh, or redneck. Those hicks or rednecks out in the country who aren't converting to Christianity. This is the time, again, Christianity was not the traditional religion, right? It was not the conservative religion. It was the new thing. It was the movement of intellectuals. It was the movement of people who were cosmopolitan. It was the movement of people who were living in the cities. The people in the country are like, I ain't in for that newfangled Christianity stuff. I'm going to keep you know, worshiping our old gods. And so the Christians would essentially call all those people rednecks, bumpkins, pagans. And of course, that is where we get the modern term pagan. After Theodosius, had, were really after Constantine, had, had made Christianity legal, there weren't many martyrs left. There were some who went out and were working on converting the Germanic folk and the Celtic folk that were out there, but there weren't a whole lot of people who were being martyred. And all the first saints were martyred folks. They were not people that were just good Christians. They're the ones that had given up their life for the cause. What ends up happening is that we start getting more folks who, after Constantine, are elevated to that sanctus, elevated to that saintly role for being exceptional Christians or for being uh, seen as being chosen by God. Now, most feasts uh, for saints were local. Like I said, you know, when it was your friend that died, people on the other side of the empire, they're not worried about, you know, whoever, Chuck died? I don't know Chuck. I don't care about Chuck, but of course the people there that loved Chuck were the ones that were celebrating that. Now, after Christianity became the religion of the empire, 
doctrine, after Christianity had become the, uh, the required religion of the empire, there was a lot of effort to bring uniformity to it. If we're going to have Christianity be the original the, or the uh, uh, official religion of our government, it needs to be the same Christianity everywhere. It can't be this piecemeal thing where these folks read these books, and these folks read these books, and these folks worship these saints. And so what we end up happening is the popes and other leaders of the church trying to bring uniformity. No longer are you just going to celebrate Chuck over here. We need to let everybody know about Chuck. We need to let everybody know, and we all need to celebrate that together. Now, fast forward a little bit. Once the Roman Empire had fallen, officially the Western Empire had fallen in 476 CE, but a few hundred years later, we're now into the Middle Ages. And sometime around the year 609 or 610 CE, while the Roman Empire that we're all familiar with in the West was gone, the Eastern Empire, the Byzantine Empire, was continuing. They were still calling themselves Romans. As a matter of fact, at this point, the Roman Emperor was still seen as the head of the church, not the Pope, not other patriarchs. Well, somewhere around the year 609 or 610, the Emperor gave a building called the Pantheon to the Pope. This was a gift to the Pope. Now, the Pantheon was originally created to be the building for all of the Roman gods. Well, once the Pope gets it, what the Pope did, of course, is he consecrated it to all of the Christian saints. This, again, is around the year 609 or 610 CE, and so you would think, okay, this is moving us in the direction of All Saints Day. And just to be really clear, Halloween is the eve of Halomas. Halomas is All Hallows Day, or all Saints Day. Though the timing's a little weird here. Boniface had consecrated this on March 13th. So the original All Hallows Day is on March 13th when he dedicated the uh, Pantheon to Mary and all of the saints. This also, though, coincided with the last day of an old traditional Roman festival, Lemuralia. I always get that name wrong. Lemuralia. Lemuralia was a three-day festival, and remember this, we had this in Samhain, except for, for the Romans, this is happening in the spring, a three-day festival where Romans did rituals to exercise restless spirits from their homes. The idea was like, for the last year, people have been coming in, maybe some of those people have died since then, uh, maybe you got some souls, you haven't been dusting enough lately, maybe it's got a little stuff in there. So you, you think it's essentially spring cleaning. Right? That's, that's all it is, but it's spring cleaning to get some of these souls out. Now, it may have just been a coincidence that he had dedicated at this point. We don't know. Sometimes you'll hear like a lot of uh, Christian holidays were set up specifically to replace old pagan holidays. And, and there are some examples of this, but this is one of those where it, it, it really just could be a coincidence. However, um, what we do know is that even though all the people in the cities and almost everybody in the countryside at this point in Rome were Christians, they were still practicing this. And so this does, whether or not it was calculated, it was kind of a good way to co-opt this. Let's, let's not maintain this old festival. We can't get you to give up these rights, right? If you're used to, like every day or every, every year, you're like, we gotta sweep the house. There's some spirits in here, and the church comes in and is like, no, we're not doing that anymore. You're going to get a little itchy, like, oh, I'm really thinking I've got to sweep it out. Well, you can go ahead and kind of graft that onto this All Saints Day. Now, a hundred years later, in the 730 CE, another pope, Gregory III, dedicated a new chapel in St. Peter's to All Saints on November 1st. So now we, we have something moving over, though... This is, you know, Christianity is still coming together kind of piecemeal. When this comes together, it's just All Saints Day for Rome. So everybody else is still practicing All Saints Day back in March 13th, but the Romans now have their All Saints Day on November 1st. Well, another hundred years after that, in 837 CE, Pope Gregory IV proclaimed that November 1st would be All Saints Day for everybody. Again, uniformity, a desire to make sure that everybody is doing it on the same time. Now, this again, we would have the temptation to be like, well, isn't this around the same time as Samhain? Are they trying to replace Samhain now? Except for, at this point, the, the primary home of Celtic civilization was Ireland. And Ireland was thoroughly Christianized, but they weren't Christianized by the Roman bishop. 
And so the Roman bishops are like, we're making this now. November 1st is All Saints Day. And the Irish are like, so? <laughs> we're, we're not going to go along with it. So again, I, I would encourage us, while it's true that sometimes the church did try to move pagan practices into Christian holidays, it wasn't always as calculated as we have often heard it to be. The Celts, or the Irish at this point, were celebrating their All Saints Day on April 20th. However, once we get to the 12th century, once we get to the 1100s, Ireland is brought into the Roman Catholic faith. They accept All Saints Day on that day. And this is where we do get, and again, it's not calculated, Samhain and those old festivals, because even the Irish Christians are, were still maintaining a lot of this idea of you can talk with your dead ancestors, you've got to be careful of all these demons that can come out on that, uh, that period of Samhain. What we do is a, it is a definite beginning of blending of the Samhain practice of blackening your face, of having bonfires, which is a common thing on Halloween still. And, of course, we still have that old Roman ideal of Lemuralia of we also want to exercise all the demons out of our houses. A lot of things are coming together. I think that at this point we can start to really see, like, Halloween as we think of it, it's not quite there yet. But we would definitely recognize it. If you came back to the 1300s, I mean, everything would be a little weird in the 1300s. But if you were hanging out in Britain or France in the 1300s, you would at least... When you get to uh, that three-day period of, of Hallow's Mass and Hallow's Eve, and as we'll see here, All, Sa uh, All Souls Day on, on November 2nd, there would be a lot of things you'd recognize. You would see people dressing up, looking kind of spooky. You would see people uh, going from house to house, doing a little jig, and asking for some food, asking for some drink. Oh, I think I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. We're going to leave that there. So, by the, again, by the time we got the 1300s, All Souls Day was practiced across Catholic Christian, the Catholic Christian world. Um, and it, it was really meant, or I should say, once we get uh, to the 1300s, November 2nd was set aside as All Souls Day. All Souls Day was a time that all Catholic Christians, and to be clear, all Christians in Western Europe were Catholic at this point, all Catholic Christians were supposed to pray for the souls of their dead relatives who were probably hanging out in purgatory. All familiar with purgatory, this is this place uh, in the Catholic faith where after you die, you still got a little bit of sin on you. You got to get that burned off before you can make your way into heaven. The more sin you have, the longer you got to hang out in purgatory. But if you say prayers for somebody, you can kind of shave a little bit of time off of that. Well, it was proclaimed in the 1300s that on uh, November 2nd, everybody needs to get together and pray for their dead relatives. We're going to try to get everybody out of purgatory as quickly as possible. And so now we have for Christianity a clear three-day holiday, just like Samhain. We have All Hallows Eve, the day before Hallow Mass. We have Hallows Mass, or All Saints Day, and then we have All Souls Day. They actually refer to this as Hallow Tide. So if you're familiar with like Yule Tide during Christmas time, this is Hallow Tide. These three days, and it was one of the most important medieval festivals. It was a time again where people focused on their dead. 13th century, the same time period, in the 1300s, we get the Black Death or the bubonic plague sweeping across Europe. This is a plague that started in China and made its way to Europe in the 1340s. Between 1347 and 1351, we have our first outbreak of the bubonic plague, uh, plague in, in Europe. And, and there, there are estimates all over the map, but there is no estimates that go beneath a third of the entire population dying over those four years. We just went through our little plague, right? you know, comparatively, uh, uh, a third of everybody you know dying within the course of four years, and some estimates place it as high as 60%. There were cities that were hit the hardest where there was no time to give everybody their proper burial, where you could not give people their last rites, which was a really important thing for people worried about their eternal soul. So what we started getting was mass, mass burials. Not only are we having too many people dying for the priests to keep up with, the priests, of course, are dying on mass. 
And so there is this, this widespread panic, actually to the point where the Pope just forgave all sins. Because there were, there were not priests out there to do that job. The Pope gave last rites for everybody. I remember years ago I was uh, visiting London and in the London uh, uh, Museum for the City of London they had this terrifying room. It was just a dark room where they had taken people's journal entries and they were reading through it. And it's, there's no horror movie that comes close to what those folks are going through. Because we remember, they don't know germ theory. They don't know why this is happening. They don't know how to stop it. They don't know if they're going to make it through. There are, for many of them, they feel like this is the second flood. It, we have not done our job right. God is angry, and he's probably going to kill all of us. Now, again, I'll remind us that no matter what, humans have a sense of humor. Uh, even with all of this horror, even with this sense of, like, we're all going to die, there were lots of folks that are like, ah, we're all going to die, let's make fun of it. For anybody who is a nurse or a doctor or knows somebody who works in ERs, they can have a pretty dark sense of humor because they have to, to be able to deal with that constant threat and that constant fear of death. So after this first outbreak, after when they got through this very first, because what's going to happen is the, the Black Death is going to come back again and again. Like every generation, they're going to have another outbreak of a plague. It's never going to be anywhere near as bad as that first one, but there's going to be plenty of bad ones in the future. What we start to see afterwards is skeletons and decaying bodies appear on a lot of artwork. This is uh, not people celebrating death. This is in many ways people making fun of death. This is how they're coping with this just, again, again, I wish there was a way that I could communicate just how, how horrific. Again, if you're familiar with The Walking Dead, what a depressing show. Nothing, nothing compared to what these folks were going through. And so what we get is the invention of the dance macabre. The, the dance macabre, or the dance of death, often would show skeletons as personifications of death dancing people to their graves, right? This, is, this was, you know, it was almost like death laughing at the people. Uh, these are, are images that are painted in churches. They're engraved on tombstones. Villages started putting on dance of death plays, and usually they did this during hollow tide. They would become really popular to remember the dead, but also to try to laugh off some of the pain. So people, even if you weren't in the play, a very common costume that people started putting on were costumes that looked like skeletons or corpses. So now we have people darkening their face sometimes to look like demons, to scare off the demons. We have people that are now dressing as skeletons, and we have people dressing as corpses. Again, I think it's just getting a little bit more familiar with each step here. And I, I will say, while the term the Grim Reaper does not become part of our lexicon until the 19th century, until the 1800s. This is where we get the imagery of the Grim Reaper. They're not using that term yet, but this is most definitely the Grim Reaper. Death is coming for you to dance your way to the grave. And I, I love this top image because one of the things that especially the lower class has got a big kick out of is death is coming for all of you. It doesn't matter if you're a pope or a king or a duke, and of course this is a time when the upper class were so far removed from the lower class, we have regular abuses. You know, the, the church had to, we, we've heard of chivalry, uh, the church had to invent chivalry to stop knights from terrorizing the peasants. Because as much as we like to think about the Middle Ages as this time of knights in shining armor and chivalry, it was a time of thug gang warfare. That's all it was. And so the lower classes, in many ways, they've been having a rough life every, already. They're getting a kick out of this. Yeah, that duke, he's, he's a jerk to me. It's all right. Death, death is going to dance into his grave someday, too. Now, like I said, the plague returns to Europe every few decades, all the way up until the early 17th century, all the way up until the early 1600s. It never kills half the population again. But there were some bad ones. England, 1665 to 1666, 20% of the population. That's one year. In one year, 20% of the population gone. And in a time before hospitals, death was something that happened at home. 
So everybody's experiencing it. You know, in, in our modern culture, death has become so removed from us. In some ways, I think that not only have we done a disservice to the dying in that, we've done a disservice to ourselves. When death is so unfamiliar, when we haven't been around it, it's, it's a lot scarier. These people are laughing at it. Because again, you know, they've had to go through it. Every parent has died at home. Every grandparent has died at home. Every children. This is, of course, a time when most children, and I, I mean that seriously, the majority of children do not make it past the age of five. And so people are, again, in many ways, reveling in this death. It was such a common reality for all. So again, we now have people that are dressing up. We have them warding off evil spirits during these days of the dead. To be clear, they're no longer practicing Samhain. Samhain is not a thing. Samhain, in the modern day, you might, if you go to certain areas, you'll, you'll hear people talking Samhain. Those are, are neo-pagans. Those are people that are trying to bring it back. Nobody's even really talking about Samhain at the time. But they do have these traditions that they have picked up from their, from their ancestors. So throughout the Middle Ages, there was often the question of how can God allow good people, and this is something that even before Christianity, religious philosophers talk about, how can God or the gods allow good people to suffer so much? And the answer that many came up with in the Middle Ages was because there are human beings willing to work with the devil, because there are human beings willing to work with Satan. And so these folks were, were usually seen as sorcerers or wizards. You know, if you're going to be a wizard, where's that power coming from? You're not getting it from God. It must be coming from Satan. And it also include heretics, people who claim to be Christian but weren't Christian the right way. And so there was a sense of Satan must have talked them into something. Now, the supposed practitioners of witchcraft were themselves heretics, sorcerers, and they were uh, people who had teamed up with Satan. And while, again, wizards were often gone after, witches were the, the ones that were primarily uh, being focused on. And of course, witch and wizard both come from the same root, come from that Wicca root. Now, in the year 1487, a book called, I'm going to butcher this name, the Malleus Malef Maleficarum, Malleus Maleficarum, was published by a priest. Uh, this book is, it translates as The Hammer of the Witches. It was meant to be a handbook for witch hunters. And it was written in three parts. In the first part, it really established that witches are real and that they are agents of the devil. Um, but it proclaimed that women are more likely to form a pact with the devil. Any idea why this would be uh, the focus within the Christian communities of the time? Who... Uh, who, who uh, screwed up Eden? Uh, just like Eve, just like Eve did this, which by the way, there'll be later Christians like Calvinists, like, uh, you know that Adam ate of the forbidden fruit too. But at this point, just like Eve, so more than likely, yes, there's going to be a wizard every now and then, but it's going to be those women. It's going to be those women just like Eve that we need to root out. And this first part listed out all the evils that can be traced, traced back to witches. So if somebody's getting sick randomly, if you don't have a good harvest that year, that's probably going to be a witch. If we have things like the Black Death coming through, that's probably witches casting spells on people. So part two was how to recognize witches. What do they look like? What types of things do they do? How do they cast their spells? How do you have counters to that spell? How can you actually come up with defenses? And if you're familiar with any modern movie, the you know, you've got to hold the cross up and things like that. That is coming from this work, from the Hammer of the Witches. It also talked about why are there so many witches out there? How are they recruiting more women to join their, their causes? And the, the argument was made was these women would place a hex on another woman, and say, the only way I'm going to let you out of it is if you join our coven. And so the idea was, even the women that are good, that you never think would do it, well, they, they can be pushed into it. Anybody can be pushed into it. And then part three was how to actually bring charges against witches. And so th this is a time where canon law or church law was, was essentially the law of most lands. And so there was a lot of case studies. I mean, this book literally had a whole section. It was essentially a law book on how do you charge women uh, uh, for this. It was one of the first bestsellers of all time. This is uh, uh, when we are just getting the printing press going, and one of the very first things, you know, we often talk about the internet is ruining us, right? All this trash out there that we're eating up. Well, we get the printing press, and one of the first things we get is a book on how to hunt down women that you don't like. 
<laughs> now, during the 1500s, 1600s, right after this period, as this is getting going, we'll be talking about this a bit, we have something called the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation, as we'll, we'll speak on here in a moment, was essentially a movement where some people said, we don't want to be Catholic anymore. What we want to do is get back to the original roots of Christianity. And it set off about a hundred years of horrific religious warfare. We're familiar with a lot of the things happening in the Middle East in the, in the modern day, particularly between Sunnis and Shiites fighting each other. Nothing like what the Christian religious warfare was in the 1500s and early 1600s. Um, to give an example, this all comes to a head in something called the Thirty Years' War, from 1618 to 1648. In that war, 20% of Germany was killed. We don't have those numbers today. 20% of Catholics and Protestants slaughtering each other. And so what we have is just tons of religious tension. And with all this religious tension, accusations of witchcraft skyrocket. Remember I said it's not just people who are sorcerers or friends with Satan, it's heretics as well. And if you're a Protestant at this time, you're sure that a Catholic is a heretic. And if you're a Catholic, you're sure that Protestants are heretics. The witch trials that, that really hit a peak, they're going to hit a peak between the years 1580 and 1650. Not a long time, but you know, 70 years. This is, this is several generations worth of time. And the women who are targeted are always women who either are more outspoken, women who own property, or women who have a voice in their community. So quite often, women who own property almost exclusively are wid uh, widows. They're almost all people who they are married to their husband, their husband dies, they get that property, and there are other men in the village who are eyeing that property. They can't get their hands on it as long as that woman is alive. This is also uh, women who were healers, who, who uh, did the job of being healers in town. Of course, those women had more of a voice. Midwives, the women that took care of delivering children, they were looked up to in their communities. And even men would sometimes listen to them. And of course, for many men, this was unacceptable. And of course, the only reason why men might be listening to them would be because why? She's a witch! I don't know if anybody's familiar with Monty Python. She turned me into a goat, but I got better. If you don't know Monty Python and you're in college, you've got to watch the whole program. <laughs> and the other thing is, of course, what's happening here is it's mostly older women, right? Older women that have inherited property, older women that have learned the traits of being midwives. And this is where we start getting the first imagery of witches being old women. In addition to this, you might be familiar, most witches have a really kind of a big nose. Can you think of any ethnicity that that often is attached to? Jewish people. And so what we have here is, is a conflagration of bigotry that is giving us our, our modern view of what witches look like. During this 70 years or so throughout Europe, Again, these numbers are hard to pin down, but there's somewhere between 100 and 200,000 witch trials. They don't all end in execution, about half of them. So that's about 50,000 to 100,000 women killed. And these, of course, are the women who are the most powerful in their communities. It's a way of cleaning house and making sure that all the women who are left know that they better not speak up, that they better keep their heads down. Along with accusations of heresy and colluding with Satan, witches were commonly uh, charged with uh, a very standard uh, type of accusation that women in the medieval period and in the modern day get, uh, get charged with, sexual deviancy. Uh, the idea was that these women, they're probably going out and having sex with Satan. They are probably having sex with more than one partner. And this, of course, if men do it, you know, boys will be boys. If women do it, there's something really wrong because sex, for a lot of it, had to do with control. Uh, we are all familiar with the witch riding her broomstick. That is not witches flying through the air. I think we might have children here, so I'll go ahead and, and leave you to it to, to use the technical term. The broomstick is a phallus that, uh, that were, uh, was often depicted with these women, and the whole idea was because they are sexual deviants, which of course they are, because they are uh, uh, worshiping Satan and they're heretics, and any woman 
who's willing to speak out and not just defer to her husband, probably is also speaking to other men. So like I said, we also had the Protestant Reformation taking, time, taking place at this point. How am I doing on time, by the way? Can anybody give me a time check? 40 till. 40 till? 20 till? 40 till. 20, 15 minutes. 15 minutes till? All right. We're, we're definitely going to go over that hour, folks. If you have to get up and walk away, I understand. I won't be offended by it. But Hallow's Eve, or Hallow's Eve, 1517. Of course, Hallow's Eve, what do we call that in the modern day? Halloween. On Halloween, 1517, a man named Martin Luther, a priest in the Roman Catholic Church, posted his 95 theses. Uh, according to the story, he nailed it to the door of Wittenberg Castle, but probably didn't do that. What Martin Luther did, he had, he had some beef with things going on in the Catholic Church at the time. The Catholic Church at this point, at the higher ranks, was pretty corrupt. Uh, popes were throwing sex parties in the Vatican at this point. They were setting up their illegitimate uh, children to be cardinals and archbishops. They were collecting money where they were actually saying, remember how purgatory, you can help, you can do prayers to get your relatives out sooner. The church started saying, you can just pay us. Give us some money, we'll say the prayers for them. Martin Luther had a big problem with this. and he, What he really wanted to do was he wanted to reform the church. He wanted to get back to what he thought his roots, uh, roots should have been. But Instead of reforming the church, what he ended up doing was starting a whole new sect, a whole new take on Christianity. Protestants started formulating this idea that there should be a priesthood of all believers, that there should not be between you and God a priest, but everybody should be able to go directly to God. They had in their mind that they were getting back to the original roots of Christianity. They weren't necessarily, but there were some uh, things that they were getting out of that. They, they started stripping away, and one of the things that the Protestants did, uh, once they decided to break with the Catholic Church, one of the things they noticed is that the Catholic Church practiced a lot of holidays that aren't in the Bible. And the Protestants had this idea of, if it's not in the Bible, it's man-made. It's made up. So we don't want to have any part of it. And so they started taking away a lot of these saints' holidays. Little by little, they were stripping things away. The... Uh, that old Celtic festival, though, of uh, Samhain, of this, this hallow mass, that was one of the first ones to go. That was one that just seemed too superstitious, seemed to have too many roots in pagan culture. Again, these current Protestants are trying to purify their religion. But in the Celtic fringe, in Scotland, in Ireland, in Wales, that old tradition kept going, partially because those areas stayed much more largely Catholic, and even for the Protestants there in that area, this is a time when Britain, or I should say England, owns Scotland, Wales, and most of Ireland. And this is their way of saying, like, we're not English. Those English want to give that holiday? Fine. We've been doing this since before Christianity. We're going to hold on to it. And what we started seeing at this point, to, as in the areas of Ireland and Scotland, what we start seeing at this point is a lot of young men that are, again, trying to really assert their identity. You can't take this away from me. A lot of young, young men on Hallow's Eve, on Halloween, started roaming the streets, drinking, singing. They went house to house asking for gifts, not dressed up. They're not doing this old salad. They're, they're drunk. Hey, 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 give me something. And, you know, maybe if you don't, there might be some type of uh, consequence for your lack uh, of participation. Young women stayed at home and practiced parlor divination. So while the young boys are there about, you know, playing with their Ouija board, seeing who loves them, who's going to, they're going to get to marry next time around. And this became part of how, again, the Irish and the Scottish could assert that they were not English. It was important to their identity. And finally, we get to what I think you probably actually came here for. In the early 1600s, there was a, a very extreme Calvinist denomination that had appeared in England. They, they called themselves Congregationalists. You probably know them as the Puritans. The Puritans really wanted to get back to what they saw as the absolute root of Christianity. And what that meant for them is there are no holidays except for Easter. None. I'll be talking about this in December. Christmas was outlawed. I don't know if you're familiar with this. We often hear about the war on Christmas. The original war on Christmas was the Puritans that made it very sure that if anybody's practicing Christmas, they were going to get a little bit of a whooping for it. Uh, uh, what this meant, like I said, you know, there's, there's no other holidays uh, that are allowed to be practiced. 
they actually took over England for a while. The Puritans went as so far to practice regicide, they cut off the head of Charles I, and they ran England for about 15 years. They shut down all of the theaters. This is kind of when Shakespeare just gets put on a shelf for a little while. They shut down all of the bars. It was not a very fun time to be in England. As a matter of fact, when their leader died, when Oliver Cromwell died, everybody's like, yeah, bring back the king. We need a party again. Now, English immigrants over this time, because they're coming uh, from, from this area that have gotten rid of these, they did not bring with them Halloween. So the original settlers of America that came in, the Puritans up in Massachusetts and the settlers down in Virginia, did not practice Halloween whatsoever. In the 1700s through the early 1800s, Halloween almost never shows up in any newspapers, in any almanacs. Old Halloween practices, they still existed in Ireland and Scotland, but there weren't a whole lot of those folks migrating over here this time. There were some Scots who were coming over this period, but most of those Scots had been uh, somewhat anglicized. They, they were not practicing their old traditional religions. But as many of you know, uh, between the years 1845 and 1852, we have something called the Great Famine of Ireland, where there's a potato blight and Irish folks are, are starving to death. It was a horrific time that the English could have stopped. They could have fed the Irish, but they didn't. And during this time, about a million and a half Irish leave home with the idea of we're going to take off so you don't have to feed us and we can send you money back so you can get your hands on some food. About a million of them ended up here in the United States. This is the very first large Catholic influx into the United States. We, there was Catholics here beforehand because there were still some English Catholics, but this is the very first time we get a whole lot of Catholics coming over and of course they brought with them that old uh, uh, Catholic custom of Hallowtide of that three-day festival. Customs that had been influenced uh, going back all the way again to Samhain. So in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, Irish and Scots were the main immigrant groups of the United States and Canada. And they established traditions of bonfires, wearing costumes, having parties, walking around asking for gifts. That is when we start to get Halloween here, is in the late 1800s. They also brought with them some pretty unique candle holders. Uh, this name, Jack O'Lanterns, comes from a Jack O'Lantern comes from an old Irish folk tale about a guy named uh, Stingy Jack. Stingy Jack was a trickster who was famous for ripping people off. He once even ripped off Satan. He had a little bet with Satan where he said that uh, uh, he told the devil that he would give the devil his soul if the devil would buy him a drink. My soul for a drink. So Satan turns himself into a coin, puts himself on the bar and Stingy Jack snatches him up and puts him in his pocket next to a cross, trapping Satan in this coin. So now, Stingy Jack's in charge, and Satan has to make a little deal with him. And then what, what Stingy Jack says is, listen, I'll let you go, but you have to agree to never send me to heaven. All right, we're agreed. He lets him go, and when Stingy Jack dies, he doesn't go to hell. He doesn't go to heaven either. He's not getting, this guy's not getting into heaven. And so Stingy Jack ends up just having to roam the earth. And the, during this festival of All Hallowtide's evening, revelers will put candles in hollowed out radishes and beets, essentially uh, making something that if you carry them around, again, you know, they're pretty small, and you would carry around these radishes and beets that you would not have the face carved in, but you would have uh, uh, little holes poked in it. And it ended up looking like there was these little flickers of light whenever people are walking around, these, these little will-o'-the-wisps. And, and the story goes, that, of course, is Stingy Jack. Well, when the Irish and the Scots come over here, they found, you know, because you can use any gourd, any radish, you know, or a, a beet's not a gourd, but you can use any of that stuff. They come over here, and they discover pumpkins. And pumpkins, now you can make one hell of a lamp, and, you know, put a face on it, it looks like Stingy Jack. This is the origin of the jack-o'-lantern, again, late 1800s, but in reality it is coming from an older uh, uh, practice of these radishes and uh, beets that are being carved out. There was also another practice, uh, and, and this is actually something that was popular in the lower classes of Scotland and Ireland, it's something called souling. On All Souls Day, November 2nd, remember this is the time that everybody said was supposed to say a prayer for all dead folk? 
the poor people in the community would walk around to, to people's houses asking for food. You go to somebody's house and say, hey, how about you feed me and we'll pray together. I can double up your prayer, right? The more prayers, you shave more time off of purgatory. And so we get the practice of making something called soul cakes. And people would have them ready. And you just would have them right next to the oven. Somebody knocks on the door, you pop it in the oven, you say some prayers together, and then you have a nice little nosh afterwards. We're again getting back into this tradition of kind of kindly asking for treats. Guising was a practice of young folk who would dress up in costumes, going house to house asking for, uh, for sweet treats. And they would perform a little song or a little show in exchange for it. It's almost like, I think of kind of like Carol, except for this is something that's happening on All Hallows' Eve. Again, echoes of Sauron. But this isn't just happening. In the Celtic world, there were some things that the old Germans had still been practicing. Uh, as we know, other European cultures had similar costume celebrations like Hallowtide. Germany and Holland in particular had something called Belschnickling. Is anybody here a fan of The Office? Familiar with Dwight Schrute? Uh, uh, Dwight Schrute speaks the truth when there is a creature named Belschnickel. Belschnickel, uh, people would, when they were Belschnickling, they would dress up like Belschnickel. Uh, he was Chris Kringle's companion. Uh, and he actually would go around with Chris Kringle on Christmas, and, and he would put on masks, he would have drinks with friends, and, and uh, have them as guests. In, in several areas of Britain, uh, particularly England, they did pick up on some of this, because in the 1700s, the, uh, uh, the monarchs of England start coming from Germany. George I was actually, he didn't even speak English. King of England didn't speak English. But they start picking up a lot of these German customs, and we'll come back to this in my Christmas lecture, because that's where we're going to get the Christmas tree from as well. They don't belschnickel. What they do is something called mummering. Mummering uh, is this idea of dressing up kind of like a ghost. So we've added another costume now. we got the, the demons. we got the... Uh, 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 Oh my goodness, this has been a long day for me, as I'm sure it has been for the rest of you. We've got the witches, we have the dead, we have the skeletons, and now we have ghosts. But I will say, this is a cute little picture of Mummering. Mummering, uh, it's still popular in eastern Canada. It's kind of terrifying. Oh, that's a family having a good old Hallow's Eve in their Mummering masks. Um, here's some Belschnicklers from 1910. Like, you know, like we worry about things looking scary today. This, this is scarier than anything I ever see anybody walking around with in the modern day. We also have something in Britain that's starting to pop up uh, in the late 1800s, something that is called Mischief Night. Sometimes it's called Mizzy or Miggy Night. And this takes place on the eve of Guy Fawkes Day. Guy Fawkes Day, just really quick, it happens on November 5th. So pretty close to this time. And it remembers a time when a uh, Catholic tried to blow up Parliament. There was a lot of, again, those religious wars between Protestants and Catholics. And the, the Catholic was caught. And ever since then, on November 5th, there is a tradition in uh, Britain, or particularly in England, to take out effigies of Guy Fawkes, you know, and knock it around and burn it to celebrate how they defeated the Catholics. It's not as popular in the modern day because there's some bigotry to that as well. Uh, if you've ever seen Beaver Vendetta, that mask, or if you've ever seen like Anonymous, those are Guy Fawkes masks. Uh, masks. Well, young Englishmen started taking after their Scottish neighbors, and on uh, the eve, on the night before Guy Fawkes night five, just to give you a little quote here, the chief of the police in Bristol, Connecticut, actually had to put out a public statement. He was going to increase patrols on Halloween night to protect residents from, quote, the persons, mostly boys, who have made life miserable for some years past, went on to say, I have no objections to boys and girls celebrating the night in a reasonable manner, but when droves of youngsters march through the streets, pelting citizens and houses with vegetables, I will make sure that somebody answer for it. Kids today, huh? The, firm, the, the term trick-or-treat first appears in the Canadian newspaper in 1927. So that term is less than 100 years old, and we'll bring this back when we get to the very end of the lecture. In 1934 is the first time that it appears in a, a U.S. newspaper. That's the first time we get the word trick-or-treat in a U.S. newspaper, and uh, this is in Portland's Oregon Journal. Young goblins and ghosts employing modern shakedown methods successfully worked the trick-or-treat system in all parts of the city. 
this was not a fun time for adults. And again, you know, if only kids could act like they did back in the day when they knew how to respect people and dress up and shake them down in the trick or treat style. Um, in 1937, this was still a novelty in a lot of places. And, and in Indiana, we have a, a newspaper that writes, trick or treat. This seems to be a popular pastime among the younger folks, and locals will hear it many times tonight, for it is Halloween. This is now ingrained in the American culture by the time we get to the end of the 1930s. This was a pastime for teenagers and young adults, and they really meant trick or treat. You give us something or you're going to pay. We'll break part of your house. We will throw fruit at your house. Um, they like to overturn outhouses, because this is a time when many people still had outhouses. They like to splash paint onto buildings. And it's so respectful. I just wish our youth could, could learn from their ancestors. And so in the 1920s, uh, in order to push back, 1920s, 1930s, in order to push back against this very hoodlum-esque activities, people started trying to soften the holiday. There was a concerted effort to make it more family-friendly. This movement started in Anaka, uh, uh, Minnesota. Is anybody familiar with the Anaka, Minnesota, Minnesota Halloween Festival? This is like the original children's Halloween. 1919, there was chaos in Anaka. I mean, it was just like the young people went out, they were breaking fences, throwing paint on things, they were roughing people up. Um, outhouses tipped over with somebody inside of it, so all the rest of it comes along. Windows all over town were soaked over. A car was put on the high school roof. A herd of cows was let loose in downtown. One was locked in a classroom. It makes me think maybe it's where Johnny Carson got his idea from, if you're familiar with that old tale. And so the local commercial club and the Kiwanis Club formed a joint committee to address the problem. And in 1920, they planned their own set of Halloween activities to preempt the plans of any of these wild youngsters. They created a Halloween parade. They set up a bonfire party for the entire town where they gave out free candy and popcorn, and it worked. Vandalism dropped precipitously, it became an annual event, and today, Anaka calls itself the Halloween capital of the world. It's a town of about 20,000, they get about 70,000 visitors every year for Halloween. So if you want to go to the original Halloween festival, it's not that far away, it, it, it could be a fun little thing. If it was a middle semester, around midterms, we we'll have to grade everything. But, so, President Barrett, if you want to give us the day off for whatever reason. <laughs> Hopefully we're all familiar with the church lady, and again, if you're not, go back and learn your SNL history. It's important history. But once the children became the focus of this, many more conservative Christian groups started really getting upset. Um, a lot of Protestants looked at it and said, like, this seems really Catholic. So we're bringing this back, and we're getting more Catholic stuff. And a lot of Catholics were saying, why are we celebrating this in the same way that the ancient pagans had celebrated? Now. Since the late 1700s, there had been a myth that Samhain, the word Samhain actually meant, quote, Lord of Death, and that it was a festival for worshiping that god. It's not true. That is not an accurate translation of it. But this was often cited by more conservative Christian groups. They claimed that children were partaking in devil worship. If anybody's familiar with some of the pushback against Harry Potter, this might sound a little familiar. Um, there are some that think that Samhain means summer's end, but... In order to try to take the holiday back for uh, more Christian ideals, many of the churches started sponsoring activities that focused on harvest instead of the dead. They still had candy and games, but they were without the scary costumes. And still to this day, I mean, we have this, I think here every year, the trunk or treat uh, uh, ideal that is supposed to make this still a wholesome activity. 1970s, the world goes a little bit crazy. The, the wild swing in the 60s are over. We have uh, a, some economic crises. There's, there's uh, a lot of fear that pops up in the 1970s. And one of the things that pops up, and we start hearing a lot of stories about children being harmed by candy. Uh, reporters uh, that there were kids that were being, in, that, that there was heroin in these candies, that there were razor blades in these candies. The problem was reporters in their uh, rush to get the scoop quite often did not really do the fact checking really well. So in 1970, a boy in Detroit died from a heroin that was supposedly put to an apple. And I know this is supposed to be a fun lecture, but it turns out that it came from a relative's home. But it got reported that some stranger out there is poisoning children with heroin. In 1974, a boy in Texas ate candy that had cyanide in it. 
it turned out that his father had poisoned his candy. This is one of those things that is it, it, a good lesson, I think, that we should all remember is that um, it's not usually strangers that hurt us. Unfortunately, it's usually the ones that are closest to us. And so if you hear stories about strangers that are going out and terrorizing, I mean, it happens, but it's not that common. But once these stories were in the public, people became very worried. As a matter of fact, trunk or treating gets a lot more popular in the 70s because they wanted to control what their kids are going into. Then in the late 70s, young adults re-entered Halloween festivals. They had made this for children. Finally, they got rid of the insanity. But in the late 70s, we get things like John Carpenter's Halloween, uh, 1978, a very gory horror movie. Uh, then we get ones like Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th. This is stuff that's not made for children. Bars started throwing costume parties. And of course, in the 1980s, uh, for any of you that are old enough, you know, 40 or older probably, you probably remember Elvira, a, a, this idea of a sexy Halloween. And sexy Halloween costumes start popping up in many ways. This is coming from these other uh, areas of our, our entertainment industry and from bars that are just bringing it back to its roots. In many ways, the sexy Halloween is a little bit more traditional than the kids. Uh, Charlie Brown Halloween. So, to conclude, you know, this is a good story. I, I hope that you took away something that, that gives you a little bit more depth. But, why does any of this actually matter? And this is something that I talk with my, my history students about quite a bit. We don't study history because it's going to get us a job. Uh, we don't study history uh, because it's going to give you a skill that you can apply to you know, knowing how to fix your car when it breaks down. The study of history exists in, or in order to enculturate wisdom. It gives us a chance to see causality, how one thing leads to another. It gives us a chance to broaden our perspective beyond our, we all have a very limited perspective. We're only here for a certain amount of time, and even when we're here, we only get to see the parts of here while we're here, uh, the parts that, that, that we're around. Um, and I, I would hope that the study of this gives us some hints as to human nature. Humans face tragedy with humor all the time. All humans throughout time have struggled with the loss of loved ones. Um, this time of year has always been a time of some type of a celebration. Whether it's about the dead or it's about the harvest, there is something, if you ever get that feeling in you in October, November, December, you are partaking in something that has been a human feeling for thousands of years. You're, you're partaking in something there that is deeply human. I also hope one of the things that this lecture gave you is that there is no such thing as pure traditions. We so often talk about, like, we've got to get back to our traditional values or our traditional culture, and it doesn't exist. Because at what point do we want to get back to the Halloween of the 1950s? Of the 1910s? I don't think I want to go back to the Halloween of the 1910s. Do we want to go back to the Halloween of the Irish immigrants that came over here in the 1860s, 1870s? Do we want to get back to Samhain? Do we want to get back to when uh, these festivals were taking place in March? W which one's the pure tradition? And so I hope that we can appreciate change, that we can embrace change. There is a fantastic quote um, from the Roman emperor, I want to say it was Claudius, I, again, my brain's a little foggy, but he makes the, the claim that Everything that feels like it's sacred because it's old was once new. You can partake in something new that changes something that you already have, but it can give you it can give you a voice in the human story. The things that you create now are going to be the traditions of your kids and your grandkids and people that come after you. And how exciting is that, that, that everything that you do plants a new tradition. And the best way to respect the traditions that came before us, enjoy them, partake in them, but don't try to make them pure, because you can't. And the people who made them weren't making them pure. They were making something new. 
Thank you, everybody. I think that this is a wonderful time of year, and I hope that you enjoy everybody around you. I hope you remember your ancestors, and I hope you maybe even come up with a new tradition that you can pass on and do again next year. Uh, don't forget two weeks. we got another one that's coming up. Do we have time for questions? Is that, what, what time is it? 8.10. It's 8.10? Oh, hey, I, I was not too far off. All right, somebody give me a question that I won't be able to answer. Claire, do I see your hand coming up? No? Did I cover all the bases? That, was I that thorough? How brilliant am I? Anybody got a new tradition they're thinking of inventing? Has anybody uh, created a new tradition in your family in the last few years? How can you honor your ancestors if you don't create traditions like they did? My family usually does a Halloween decoration with our neighbors. Ah, I like that. It's kind of like the Christmas uh, decoration contest, but bringing that to Halloween. I, I, I have nothing in my front yard this year, and I feel kind of bad about it. It's so yes. wonderful seeing people decorate. I absolutely love all the stuff out there. Yeah, Lori. So, we don't use real pumpkins at my house because squirrels eat them. Mm -hmm. So, we use plastic pumpkins. Oh, okay. All right. You know, th th this is it's, it's a modern take on an old tradition, though, as we now know, not that old of a tradition. They eat the neighbor's pumpkins. They don't eat them. They are. The squirrels got to eat. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, the best way to, to partake in things is to...